Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to the online gathering of Samanach Baptist Church. Um, among the many things that are true right now, some of the most true are, we are children of mercy who have been given a living hope. We're called to worship by a reading from Psalm 116. I'll be reading verses 1 through 4 and then verses 12 to 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Costly in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This is God's word. Let us pray. But chiefly, we are bound to praise you, Lord God, for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the true Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Father, you are good. And we come to your, into your presence in the name of your Son this Easter season. We come trusting that you have given all authority in heaven and on earth to your risen and ascended Son. Lord Jesus, we glory in your atoning death on our behalf. We glory in your resurrection from the dead. And we hope in your ascension to the right hand of the Father. Lord Jesus, I ask you to intercede by the Spirit to your Father on behalf of my brothers and sisters. I pray especially for those who are lonely. I pray especially for those who are frightened. I pray especially for those who are in specific needs. Lord Jesus, you know what they need. Lord Jesus, you feel their loss and their, their pain with them. We trust you to ask our good Father for what they need. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our faithful high priest. We exalt and worship you, the one who defeated death by his death, the one who rose from the dead, and the one who ascended to the right hand of the Father and through whom we have been given the spirit of new life. Would you now teach us as we gather this day? We pray through the Son and by the Spirit and everyone together said, Amen. Our reading from the Gospels this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, 
What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company have amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. The text that I'd like us to pay attention to together today is found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll be looking at verses 13 to 25. Before we look at this text, let's pray together, please. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, we long with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We long for you to be known to us in the breaking of bread. We long to gather together as your followers around the table, and we long for you to feed us together. That is something that we're not able to do right now. For the sake of the health of our community, we are temporarily forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But while we wait by the Spirit, would you cause with those first disciples our hearts to burn within us? to be gathered together, to have the scriptures opened to us and interpreted for us in light of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, for you to be revealed to us, not only in the scriptures, but also in the breaking of bread. We now ask that this time where the scriptures are opened to us, that Lord Jesus, through this technology, you would, in a mysterious, mystical way, be known to us as we look into your word. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God remains forever. So now may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of each heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. And all of God's people said together, amen. Would prophets and angels be impressed with our individual lives? Would prophets and angels be impressed with our corporate life? Last week, we looked at 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9, and our reading for this week starts in verse 13. And if you're paying attention, you may have noticed that the lectionary skipped three verses. And I just can't allow that to happen because what's happening in this paragraph is something that I think we need to consider. Verse 10 says this, concerning this salvation, the salvation we are receiving, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. They searched and inquired carefully because they wanted to know something about the grace that was to be ours, yours and mine. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when the Spirit predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were servants not of themselves, but you. That's us. These prophets were serving us in the things that now have been announced to you, us, through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So the benefits that you and I are receiving, the salvation that you and I are receiving by grace, is something that the prophets intensely research to find out something. It's something into which angels long to look. And my question is, if those same prophets and those same angels were to examine our lives as individuals, if they were to examine our corporate life together, would it be something that impressed them. If they, prophets and angels, examined our lives, what would they see? I'm afraid that they would see anxiety. Anxiety that is built upon a love of money. I'm afraid they would wonder why we're so concerned with believing the right things more than we are about following Jesus. Easter season, we read these gospel texts. One that we haven't read yet is in Matthew 28, where Jesus, the risen Lord who is about to ascend, says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make, what does he tell them to make? They're told to make disciples, learners, followers, apprentices of Jesus. Notice that the risen Christ does not say They're supposed to make believers. They're supposed to make disciples. And I wonder if angels and prophets looked at our lives as individuals and our corporate life together and wonder, why do they emphasize so much believing the right things? And they tend to minimize, in light of that, following and obeying Jesus. I'm afraid these same prophets and angels, if they were to examine our individual lives and our corporate life together. They might challenge our infatuation with kings and presidents who haven't died for us and who haven't rose from the dead. I'm afraid that they would remind us that the risen Jesus is king and he is the only one we should take seriously. Personally, I'm afraid they might ask me, why are you so easily angered these days and why are you not sleeping well? Anybody else, anybody else feel that? Find themselves with not very much emotional margin, find themselves easily frustrated, easily angered. And I think together that goes with not sleeping well. Personally, I'm fighting not to regard everyone I encounter as if they have annoying hiccups. When I was a kid, Um, I would get the hiccups. And that really wasn't a problem 
for me, but then there were other people in my life who found those hiccups particularly annoying. And because I was so sanctified back then, I thought, how annoying could I make these hiccups? Driving somewhere in the car, <laughs> trying to make it as loud as possible. And that would drive other people in the car crazy. Right now I feel my siblings pain, even if people don't have annoying hiccups, because it just seems like we're navigating life these days on edge. And I get that. Many of us are dealing with legitimate anxiety. Some of you are going into workplaces each day where people have tested positive for COVID-19. Some of you in your neighborhoods know people who have tested positive for COVID-19. And, and that anxiety does do this thing to us that it, it just seems like everybody, even if they are socially distant from us, are like that younger brother who has annoying hiccups. Is your life, is my life, is our life the type of life for which prophets searched and inquired? Is your life, is, is our life the type of life into which angels long to look? 1 Peter 1, 13 to 25 gives us a vision of the type of life that would impress prophets and angels. It gives us a vision of a type of life, kind of like a really good movie that has a really good main character. And after you see that film, and it affects you, it gives you a desire to go live that kind of life. Watching It's a Wonderful Life makes us want to live life, not like Henry F. Potter did, but like George Bailey did. Watching Up makes us want to live a life like Russell, who just loves and accepts and wants to relate to everyone. Watching Saving Private Ryan wants us to live a life of sacrifice and courage, like Captain John Miller. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 25 gives us four visions of a transformed life. The first vision is found in verse 13. Peter says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The ESV gets this translation right because it gives us first two participles and then the main verb. I'm sorry to get all grammar nerdy on you here, but the main verb in verse 13 is set your hope fully. And then before that verb, Peter gives us two participles that tell us what it looks like to set your hope fully. We set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you and me at the revelation of Jesus Christ by, one, preparing our minds for action and being sober-minded. That preparing your minds for action comes from an idiom in the Old Testament and the New Testament, gird up the loins of your mind. It carries with it the idea that people in the Middle East wore these long, basically, t-shirts that went down to their sandals, and it inhibited movement. So before they would then go to run or go to experience any type of physical activity, they would then grab the bottom of their shirt and tuck it into their belt so that they would then be free to do what they needed to do. So there's an intentionality, a get your mind ready for doing what's most important. Getting your mind doing ready for what? Setting your hope on the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The second participle there in verse 13 is then being sober-minded. So the vision that Peter gives us in verse 13 is, a, is, is this transformed life. Transformation is built upon future hope. And for that 
to happen for hope in what Jesus Christ will bring us when he in the last day is finally revealed, we must have, one, a settled mind, and secondly, we must also have self-control. So the first vision, verse 13, transformation, the kind of life into which prophets and angels long to look, is built upon future hope. The second vision in verses 14 through 16, as obedient children, notice throughout this paragraph, family language, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So now if we have a hope that's set fully on the grace that Jesus will bring to us when he is revealed, now that future hope, secondly, creates transformation because this transformation that's built upon future hope is now oriented toward loving holiness. Now there's two things we need to see here. One, Loving holiness is about devotion, okay? Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all your conduct, for as it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. What holiness means here is devotion, set-apartness. It's kind of like if you go into a furniture store, and you see that couch or that chair or that end table that you really want, and there's a sign on it that says, sold. What that means is that piece of furniture is not available for you to even consider purchasing. It has been set apart for someone else or to look into the future, going into a restaurant, a nice restaurant that has like, cloth tablecloths and, 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 and silverware. And you come to that table that just looks like that's in the perfect spot. And you see a sign in the middle of it that says reserved. That is not set apart for you to consider enjoying your meal at. It has been set apart for someone else. That's really what the word holiness means in this passage. Holiness means set apart, devoted to God. Several months ago in midweek Bible study, we walked through Leviticus together and we talked about different understandings of what holiness is. In Leviticus, there are dishes that are called holy. What does that mean? It means that they have been set apart for a different purpose. So holiness is about devotion to God. Secondly, loving holiness is about proximity. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy. So those two phrases, as obedient children and he who called you, those are so important for us understanding what holiness is because loving holiness is about devotion, but then it's also about proximity. What happens is God is holy and he calls to himself people who aren't holy in order for them to be made holy. This is what Jesus does all throughout Luke's gospel. He breaks bread in our gospel reading this morning with people who don't even believe in his resurrection. But then, since he comes to them through the medium of the table and the breaking of bread, what does he do? He awakens their faith by proximity. So we are called as obedient children, as those who've been called by God. We become set apart to God by God in his holiness, drawing near to us that he may then not catch our sin, but we may then catch his holiness. 
Sinclair Ferguson describes this understanding of holiness very well. Speaking about Luke 15 and how the Pharisees and the scribes got so angry with Jesus because he received sinners and ate with them. That's something that got the religious leaders in Jesus' day so upset. I love these words from Sinclair Ferguson. The Pharisees and scribes had obviously never read the Hebrew Bible carefully. From its third chapter, Genesis 3 onward, it tells the story of the God who receives sinners and eats with them. That was what the annual feasts of the Old Testament calendar were all about, how God receives sinners and eats with them. So, transformation, verse 13, is built upon future hope. Verses 14 to 16, transformation is oriented toward loving holiness. Third vision, transformation then happens within the father's household. Do you see this paternal language again? Verses 14 to 16, as obedient children. Verse 15, but he who called you. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. What does that look like? What does that fear look like? It looks like this, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So the space in which this transformation toward loving holiness that is built upon future hope happens is within the father's household. If you regard as father, if you call as father, verse 17 says, That has household, extended family language in it. In other words, there is a father who then has sons, and then they have sons and daughters, and it becomes this extended family, but then the father is regarded as as the leader, the head of that extended family. Peter is talking about how God is creating this household, and members of this household fear him. What does that mean? It means they don't fear Caesar. It means they aren't afraid of the threats that the world and earthly empires want to give them. How do they fear him? How do they acknowledge him? They aren't afraid of him. They acknowledge his position as the head of this family and his authority is the authority they take seriously. How do they do that? Notice again the participle, verse 18. Knowing that the way we conduct ourselves with fear, the one who is going to evaluate our deeds to see if we have been transformed, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile, frightened ways of this world. So this God is not a God we have to be afraid of, but he's a God we have to fear and acknowledge his position. Why? Because he's the God who's revealed in the Lamb who shed his blood to ransom us. So we've got three visions so far of a life into which prophets and angels long to look. That transformed life is built on future hope. That transformed life is oriented toward loving holiness. That happens within the Father's household. So what does that holy, hopeful transformation look like? That leads to our fourth vision. Holy and hopeful transformation resembles Christ-like love. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. That's speaking there of the kind of salvation we've received. 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, what's the purpose? For a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Holiness is not about separating from sinners. Holiness is about Christ-like love. This holy and hopeful Christ-like love is why the Word of God endures. I pray before every time I preach, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of our God remains forever. That's quoting from Isaiah. Peter quotes the same passage here. That word has been given to us. Why? That we might love one another. Brothers and sisters, that holy and hopeful Christ-like love is what this world needs. So finally, one, one takeaway for a transformed life. A life that would be impressive to the prophets who predicted it, and to the angels who longed to look upon it. My takeaway is this. We need to refuse information inebriation. Back again to verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Being sober minded. We can't set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed if we are drunk in our minds, if we are inebriated by information. Herbert Simon said, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Brothers and sisters, we are so inundated with information. We are drunk on information. We have it coming to us left, right, middle, center, above, below. It's just constantly coming to us. And then now we have these smartphones in our pockets that in these days we are more even dependent upon technology and there's good and noble and moderate uses for it. But I'm afraid we are sometimes getting inebriated with information. So we need to refuse what we're calling information inebriation. So what would that look like? Just a couple of examples. One, Consume information in moderation. I'm not asking us to be teetotalers when it comes to information, but I am asking us to be moderate in our consumption of information. I think it would be wise for you and for me to only check the news twice a day. And for some of us, that's probably going to be difficult because it's on all the time. Brothers and sisters, having cable news, whatever network, on in the background all the time is information inebriation. You can't be sober-minded if you are constantly consuming information. What fruit does watching cable news, what fruit does thinking about conspiracy theories bear in your life. I've never met anyone who spent much time watching cable news. I've never met anyone who spends time delving into all of these conspiracy theory websites who I could describe as sober-minded. It's just not a good use of the space God has given you in your mind. Twice a day needs to be the maximum way we consume this information. Secondly, to refuse information inebriation, we need to get out of our heads 
by going for walks without our phones. At least once a day, if not more. In a safe and socially distant way, I think we need to take a walk and leave our phone at home. I was talking with a good friend of mine this week about road trips. Remember when you'd go on a road trip, drive somewhere 500 miles with your family, and your younger brother would get the hiccups in the car and just really be annoying with that? Now we take road trips and we have these podcasts to listen to and we have these videos to watch and, and we've just, we can be inebriated with entertainment and information. Brothers and sisters, doctors and scientists and, and, and neurologists tell us that this is bad for our mental health if we don't ever have time anymore where there is space and silence and boredom to deal with. A lot of us are at home bored stiff. I get it. But don't give that time to just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Once a day, twice a day, three, four, half a dozen times a day. Go for a walk without your phone. Finally, replace the information. This is going to be difficult for some of us because we spend hours and hours and hours on social media, on the internet, on cable news. There's going to be withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> we need to find something to replace the information with. I remember helping an alcoholic break his addiction. And one of the things that his doctor said is he needed to find something to replace the alcohol with. So for him, it was sun-kissed pop. So twice a week, I'd bring him a 12-pack of sun-kissed orange pop. And we'd have a couple of those together talking and just to kind of try to somehow get that edge off. And he was able to break that addiction by finding something to replace the alcohol with. So what you and I need to do if we are going to step away from information inebriation, we need to replace it with something. So I'm going to go totally old school here. And I think we need to give ourselves during this pandemic, during this quarantine, to scripture memory. I think it's good for us when we take those walks without our phones, when we turn off the news, when we put our phones on do not disturb, when we plug them into the charger and step away from them. I think we need to step away towards something. And what I think the best thing we can do is in obedience to the psalmist, we can meditate on God's word day and night. So in your scripture reading, finding a phrase, finding an image, finding a passage to spend an entire day, two, three times a day, meditating on the words of scripture. Here in a few moments, we're going to pray and I'm going to give you an example of how to do that. Psalm 116 was our psalm for this third Sunday of Easter. And I love the first two verses. And I think these are good words to meditate on. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Just finding a phrase like that. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Instead of calling on our smartphone, instead of calling on that cable news anchor throughout the day, let's use this extra time we have to, with the psalmist, call on the name of the Lord to plead for mercy because he promises to incline his ear to us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. God of new life, we look for your resurrection power 
in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. You satisfy us with your steadfast love. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. For Barbie Anthonette, Beth Westbrook, Katie Frulin, Earl Ashmore, Jonathan Lichty, and all the teachers in our community who are grieving the loss of the year's conclusion with their students. Have mercy on them. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. You come to us in many and various ways. We pray for our community and for our neighbors. For Caleb Christian, Megan Christian, Lee Kowalczyk, Dalen Johnson, and all the class of 2020 who are grieving the loss of the celebration and joy they expected at the end of their senior years, have mercy on them. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. You are our strength and our song. We pray for the churches and all places that we may be one in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. You hate wickedness and love righteousness. We pray for the world that your reign may come and your will be done on earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are working and living near those infected with COVID-19, have mercy on them, protect them, incline your ear to them. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Because you incline your ear to us, we offer you other concerns we carry in our hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. God of new beginnings, you raise us from the grave and draw us into your glory. In your love, release us from all that binds us to death, that we may be eternally bound to you through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus, with whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Grace and peace. Much love to you all.